the optimal characteristics of the environment where you want to work. Um, uh, Dr. Adrian Park is going to talk about uh, how to get there, which undoubtedly will involve some degree of negotiation. Um, Dr. Park is Professor of Surgery in Annapolis, Maryland, and he is um, uh, going to talk about critical aspects of negotiation, when you should compromise and when you should hold fast. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Blair and David, for the opportunity to share some thoughts here. Um, and I've got infinite time, it would appear, so uh, that's great. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'll start uh, by saying that I have no um, commercial conflicts uh, regarding this to, to disclose. However, uh, being that I may end up recruiting one of you at some point, I'm very conflicted uh, about how many of my secrets to give up here in this, uh, in this presentation. But anyway, I'll get over that. So we'll do a little bit as in a few minutes we'll talk about the, um, uh, just some of the principles of negotiation and then I'll get a little more focused on the, the context and the situations in which you will find yourselves uh, negotiating or needing to negotiate and then uh, we'll uh, get a little more specific about some of those issues as well. So <coughs> negotiation has been described as the art of reaching an agreement by resolving differences through creativity. It is often said that you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. Now this, I hope, is a little uh, more germane to the cutthroat finance world than, than, than ours, but, but I think there's an element of truth even in, in hopefully more altruistic pursuits even such as our own. Um, it, it is without question uh, an acquired skill and one that you have no reason not to get better at. Uh, nothing that you can uh, disdain and, and ignore. You need, to, you need to learn how to do this well and you need to continually improve that skill. Now, there are great uh, portions of the world's population who, uh, for whom uh, negotiating and haggling and bargaining is a fact of life and is the spice of life. And I grew up in the developing world and negotiating, bargaining over whether you're buying a pair of shoes or a mango, it's just part of life. And um, you kind of learn these skills early on. Coming back to the West, uh, sometimes you realize you can't go into Macy's and then try to bargain for a pair of shoes. So uh, there are contexts within which you, uh, you need to hone your negotiating skills. <coughs> so when we talk in terms of principles of negotiation, uh, we'll talk a little bit about a couple of styles and you'll recognize these. There's nothing uh, set in stone about these, but you'll recognize these. We'll talk a little bit about positional versus principled uh, negotiation and then, and then just very basically what some of these steps are. And then as I say, we'll, we'll jump into the, the content that's more germane to, to what lies before you. So you can, in terms of styles of negotiation, there's essentially what we call a quick style and then a, a more deliberate style. And the quick style would be one where you're, you're negotiating in a bit more of a hurry. You're not planning on a relationship with the other party with whom you're negotiating. You're not planning on any future negotiations. And really, you just want to get the best deal and then get out of there. And, and the outcomes in those situations are usually acceptable at best. You don't cherish often those outcomes, such as when you're buying a car. You, you hope you got you got uh, a good part of that deal, but uh, again, it's not necessarily a particularly cherished experience. The more deliberate style of negotiation would be one that requires uh, preparation and work on, on your part uh, more. It's not that you didn't do uh, preparation when you're doing your research when you're out to buy that car, but um, you need to understand a little bit more uh, of the issues surrounding that negotiation process and, and the folks on the other side of the table. Um, you need to be uh, doing a little bit of preparation in terms of where they're coming from, what their expectations might be. Uh, this is a situation in which you're, there, there will hopefully be a longer term uh, relationship um, that will be established. And so you're going to want to be a lot more cooperative and reasonable in establishing that relationship. And usually, uh, when this is done well, both sides are satisfied, and again, it, it uh, can lead to a more stable long-term uh, relationship. And this, hopefully, would better characterize the style that you would use uh, when you are uh, negotiating a contract, your, your, your contract, such as we'll discuss in a minute. Now, um, this uh, group, uh, Fisher, Umi, and Patern, have described uh, positional uh, versus principled negotiation or bargaining. And looking at positional bargaining, again, these are somewhat uh, um, uh, anchor positions, somewhat caricatured positions, but the soft, you'll recognize this, again, in terms of principles of negotiation, the soft position would be when the partners are collegial, 
uh, your goal out of this negotiations agreement, you're prepared to change your position, uh, you, you want to make an offer, you try to avoid uh, finding yourself in this contest of wills, and uh, you really, at the end, want to insist on agreement. Now this stands in contrast, again, to the hard position, uh, bargaining position, where uh, the, pr the participants are adversaries, uh, the goal is victory, you dig in on positions, you don't make offers, you make threats, uh, trying to win is a contest of wills, and uh, you insist on your position, and, and uh, there are, uh, these are much more uncomfortable situations, and, um, <clears throat> In the business world, this happens, and unfortunately, in forms of arbitration, whether it's med mal uh, or other ways, you, you, you come across this hard positioning uh, style. When you, when uh, the, the principled style, by contrast, as opposed to taking a, whether it's a soft or a hard position, the principled uh, uh, bargaining uh, style or the uh, um, uh, uh, this entity uh, is, is characterized by four principles. So you separate people from the problem, you focus on interest, you invent options for mutual gain, you assist them, insist on objective criteria. The separating the people from the problem uh, really means on focusing on the issue. So you can you can go easy on the uh, on whoever you're dealing with, but be very hard and very focused on, on the problem. And in fact, when you are hugely objectively focused on the issues, how, how much do you trust your negotiating um, uh, partner uh, is, is less important. Um, so you, you make this a much more objective, much less subjective uh, encounter. Uh, once again, you're, when focusing on the interest, you're not holding a position, you're not holding an anchor position, either hard or soft. Um, you're looking for, for mutual uh, benefit, mutual uh, gain here. And when you do that, um, sometimes you have to be a bit creative and you have to be able to come up with some original ideas. And that takes a little bit of mental elbow grease, but it's usually a, a fairly edifying uh, uh, experience uh, at the end if you do that. And, and once again, insisting on objective criteria, not just uh, focusing objectively on the issues, but objective criteria is really important. It takes a little more, more mental discipline, uh, but uh, uh, the principles, if you would, of principled bargaining, I think, are, think are, are, are wise and um, to be adhered to when you can. Now the actual steps of negotiation, the process of negotiation, you can, you can look at it, I think, in three broad strokes. One is the, the preparation portion, or where you're doing your homework, your investigation. Uh, second is the actual bargaining, and the third is what does the agreement look like? Um, and in the <coughs> uh, preparation step, it's what we've talked a little bit about. Um, what uh, do you need? And usually it's not too hard for you to think broadly about what you need or want. It is, it takes a little more elbow grease, mental elbow grease, to think um, uh, strategically and think in the context of principled bargaining, uh, what you want versus what you need. And this comes back to the negotiables versus the non-negotiables. Where do I hold fast versus where am I prepared to compromise? And that's part of the preparation before you enter into this uh, negotiating process. At the same time, you need to be thinking about what the other side needs. If you go in oblivious to what the other side's needs are, <clears throat> you're setting off on the wrong foot. Um, and so that's part of the preparation. And, and, and you need to understand what the boundaries are to be credible in the negotiating, what the boundaries are from their perspective as well as yours of this negotiation. Uh, and then you need to decide on your style. And uh, you know we've presented a few styles. The quick style, the hard style uh, are not gonna probably serve you very well in the kinds of negotiations that you're gonna engage in. Um, at any stage, particularly when you're in the actually bargaining uh, uh, step, um, you just need to be asking questions. You need, to, you need to go after clarity continually. If it's something's not clear, make no assumptions. Always seek clarity. Always ask questions. And again, uh, be creative, be flexible. Uh, <clears throat> when it comes to seeing what the agreement looks like, it's very important to pay attention to detail in terms of how these concepts that you've just negotiated are transcribed uh, on paper. Uh, and paying attention to those details is very important. Uh, in all things, uh, aiming for plain language, if you have a, a good employer, a, a thoughtful employer increasingly is going to try for those important aspects of this negotiation when you actually reduce this to paper to use plain language as much as possible. Uh, I always am very sub suspicious of obfuscating uh, language on a contract. There's, it, it, it just doesn't need to be that way. Um, uh, and once again, you're asking questions. You both have to be comfortable, or you should be comfortable, especially you should be comfortable uh, at, at the agreement step of this, uh, of the process. So, um, 
moving then from kind of the principles of negotiation, the styles you can be thinking about, the actual steps that you need to prepare for, um, what kind of things are you likely to be involved in negotiating? Well, your contract, and that's what we're here to talk about. But it's not um, uh, unlikely at all, as your career progresses through the next few years, that you will have to bring negotiating ability to some form of conflict re resolution, whether it's in your group or in a clinical uh, setting um, or uh, some kind of operational unit. Um, depending what your career aspirations are and, and, and how far you rise up in leadership, um, <clears throat> even in the medical world, dealing with, and increasingly in, here in the U.S., um, uh, dealing with uh, acquisitions and mergers and what that means as, as uh, entities uh, come together and, and how you uh, then, if you're a leader in that role, uh, what you need to be negotiating. And then sometimes, depending upon the climate you live and work in, within that uh, context, you can have to negotiate with groups and with unions and things like that. <clears throat> I, I use these examples, none of which are on your radar screen right now, except for negotiating your contract, just to, to make you aware that there are many ways uh, and many um, applications in which you'll be able to, to use these skills. So we're going to talk about negotiating your contract. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, in broad strokes, when I was thinking about how best to organize this for you, uh, there's really about three different three different. Um, employment uh, um, opportunities or employment models for you now. One is you can be private practice, the other is that you're going to be a hospital-based um, surgeon, so essentially an employed surgeon, and the other uh, which for which there will be overlap is, is, is an academic uh, practice. And again, uh, to some degree, all of these uh, can uh, overlap. Now, um, in, in, in in considering these three different models, again, I would urge you at the outset um, in your preparation, and just even as we're thinking about it now, to be considering what your interests and your positions are, and again, the negotiables, the non-negotiables, the where you hold fast, where you compromise. But you also, as I've said a couple of times, have to be thinking about the man and what his, you're negotiating uh, uh, um, the, other, the person on the other side of the table, uh, what their um, interests and positions are. Coming to that discussion, oblivious of that, uh, you lose credibility fairly quickly. You can come off as a naive, um, and uh, lightweight if you have if you don't come with that kind of perspective you don't have to understand all the issues but you need to be thinking more more broadly um, <clears throat> and the actual L, the actual issues that we'll just spend a few minutes talking about and I know these are things that you want to spend a lot longer and maybe in the discussion we can talk about a little bit more but are these these four areas we're going to talk very briefly about the non-compete or restrictive covenants about compensation the without cause clause of all of your contracts, uh, which is also sometimes re referred to as liquidated damages, and then uh, incentive uh, arrangements. Um, I, so trust uh, <laughs> uh, but verify is, a, is, is an important uh, concept in all <laughs> negotiations. Um, <coughs> yeah. Now, um, I'm just going to have a brief, say a brief word about lawyers. We'll refrain from the obvious uh, target that they can be, but making uh, gratuitous comments. But um, I think that I think that this is a this is a, a sensible way to kind of understand their role. Uh, conflicts can come. This is from the UN Conference on Trade and Development. Conflicts come from uh, substantive disagreements, but sometimes also from misunderstandings on language. And um, so I would suggest to you the role of an attorney, of a lawyer, in looking at your contract. These are the things you need to be thinking of. Their role is not to pull apart clause by clause the 25 pages of the standard contract that you will get from your employer, whether that's a private practice, whether it's a hospital-based employment system, whether it's a university medical, a university teaching center. Um, that is not uh, their job. As one who issues these contracts and in, is involved in, in recruiting and employing, has done a lot of surgeons, there are substantive issues that you need to get to. But nothing turns off an employer more than some lawyer who's trying to show their worth to you by going phrase by phrase, clause by clause, and editing what everybody ends up having to sign at some point anyway. Now there are important elements of that. There's probably about two pages of the 25 pages that they really need to pay attention to. But there are times when that clause by clause bit, the amount of work that goes into it, uh, I was talking, I've talked to a few uh, of the attorneys and contract folks in various systems about this, and interestingly, there's a uniform impression that when that happens, 
that employee, that recruited uh, physician, often enter, en ends up at a lower dollar value just because of the frustration of having to do that. So you need to use your attorney, your lawyer, to help you understand the terms. Y you need to use your attorney to help you understand what's in those 25 pages, to interpret for you and to educate you. But I would, I would uh, encourage you to refrain uh, from uh, returning a document that's got red on it for 25 full pages. Um, but but that, that role of, of interpreter and, and, and educator is very important. You need to understand in plain language what your contract is, is expecting of you, requiring of you. All right, well, the non-compete <coughs> or the um, restrictive covenant. Now, interestingly, there are moves afoot, and you will... You'll read in the lay press uh, of moves afoot to challenge the constitutionality in this country, in the United States, of uh, the whole concept of restrictive covenants. It's just there's a bunch of folks who think this is utterly un-American and unconstitutional and uh, um, shouldn't exist. I would uh, tell you uh, in the next uh, six to 12 months when you're negotiating contracts, don't count on this being batted down by the Supreme Court. Uh, you are going to need to deal uh, with restrictive covenants. Um, now... Uh, these are really important, again, to the man. Um, uh, there are usually a couple of elements to this. One is the size or the range, and that is to say, um, uh, Duck Job is, uh, is practicing in, in uh, Pittsburgh, and the restrictive covenant that he may or may not have signed may say 20 miles. Uh, you're, you're restricted uh, for practicing within 20 miles. Now, it, it may say 50 miles. It may say 10 miles. The farther out that restrictive covenant goes, the less enforceable it is. Uh, and the other things, there are issues such as, is, and this may sound pedantic, but it's real. Is it 20 miles as the crow flies, or is it 20 miles as you drive, uh, as roads can take you? Uh, and these sound like silly little points, but they're actually very important points, because sometimes uh, covenants are, uh, fall or hold based on um, 0.5 of a mile, and it's whether you can drive it or fly it or what construction's doing on the road. Uh, the other issue is the duration of that restrictive covenant. Uh, is it uh, standard one year? Is it two years? Is it 18 months? Both the size or the radius and the range and the duration of the uh, non-compete are usually negotiable depending upon how much uh, uh, they want access to you. There, there's usually some uh, negotiation involved there. Now, as a surgeon, interestingly, and I, I, I believe this holds up for most jurisdictions within the country, as a surgeon, you can't be restricted from practicing in a hospital. You can't be restricted from, from doing a case, even in a competing hospital. You can be restricted from being employed by, having a practice near, uh, or anything like that. But you actually, at the end of the day, cannot be, as a surgeon, restricted from operating in any hospital. Um, uh, any such language is usually not enforceable, and most folks won't, won't, won't try it. You can absolutely be restricted from being employed by a competing hospital or from having a practice within uh, a range uh, based on, supported by, or whatever by that hospital. But, but interestingly, uh, you, uh, you, you cannot be um, restricted from operating the hospital. Now, non-solicitation is another important aspect of the non-compete, um, and this you have to be very clear on, and this, you, this is where your attorney uh, needs to provide that insight and um, that education. Um, usually it has to do with any contact and what the kind of contact you can have with your patients. Um, the, the concept with this is the patients belong to the practice, the patients belong to the hospital, they are not yours. You cannot take them with you. Um, however, when patients come to you and ask you, there are, there's a range of what's acceptable in terms of what you can tell them. And this obviously does not apply to patients who are actively under your care. Um, <clears throat> the issue has more to do with um, the referring doctors, what you can say and how much you can solicit the referring doctors. And again, um, you... There's negotiation, there's interpretation, but there's negotiation around this. This is not something you think about when you uh, necessarily, when you take your first job, but these are issues that, that will absolutely impact uh, how you transition or end or move from that first job. Uh, now, interestingly, media advertising is usually exempt from um, non-solicitation clauses. Uh, uh, they, can't, uh, they, they can't control the media, so you usually have access to, um, to media. All right, moving then to the other element, compensation. What I'd say on the compensation issue is, uh, as we talked about being prepared and doing your homework ahead of time, knowing the numbers 
uh, is really important. If you're heading into a private practice uh, situation, knowing the MGMA numbers, knowing if you're heading into an academic practice, knowing the AAMC numbers, these are published, these are publicly available, uh, they're regionally oriented and, and organized into percentiles and medians and, and all that kind of thing. So you, ca you can have access to, uh, if you're taking a job at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, what, the, um, uh, what the median number for an assistant professor of surgery is uh, in that uh, domain, in that region. Um, and the same thing if you're coming uh, to Baltimore uh, into a private practice situation, the MGA numbers are out there for the whatever percentile. And those will be the basis of what you do. Now, how many uh, Canadian fellows are in the audience, just a matter of interest? Okay, a couple. Yeah, don't be timid. Put your hand up there. We're proud. Okay. Um, so, uh, this element, I'm not sure, and maybe, uh, see Dr. Free there, you can comment. I don't think there's restrictive uh, covenant uh, type language in Canadian practice. Uh, the numbers uh, are, are much more kind of uniform, uh, and, and there's usually kind of, especially in the academic setting in Canada, that there's, a, there's a very set salary structure, and they're a lot more uniform uh, than here. Um, but here, um, you really do have to know those numbers, and, and you need to be realistic, and uh, even if the first year numbers don't look great, uh, look at the second year numbers, look at what you move to, and, and then even beyond that, and what the plan is to get you to a happy place um, in, uh, on that national scale. Um, relocation versus signing bonus, um, this should be a part of what you ask for. Uh, it's, it won't necessarily be offered, but you need to be asking for this. Uh, some institutions, <clears throat> just for uh, cleanness and, and, and ease of, um, of negotiations, will actually give you a signing bo bonus versus a relocation. The relocation uh, dollars gets a little more complicated because in m most um, uh, jurisdictions, they're taxable, it's a taxable benefit, and so trying to figure out how much they gotta pay you so you're, after taxes, you're actually covered for that expense is sometimes a little more difficult than actually saying, okay, this is your signing bonus and you can move and do whatever you want with it. Um, loan repayment, again, this will not be a standard part of any contract. Um, this is something you need to be asking about. And loan repayment usually comes hand in hand with some form of investment. So if you negotiate uh, $1,000 a month loan repayment, um, that will usually commit you to three years or five years or whatever. And if you leave before that, you need to understand what the penalty is. Do you lose 50, do you have to repay 50% of the loan uh, um, benefit? Do you have to pay 100%? At what point are you invested uh, in that loan repayment? When does, that, when does that go away? It's an important point. This will not be on most contracts. You need to be asking about this. Uh, what's the guarantee? Uh, do you have a one-year guarantee, a two-year, a three-year guarantee? At the outset, you don't have, again, it's a supply and demand thing. You may not have the bargaining power uh, that you will at different stage in your career uh, to, to demand a three-year guarantee. Uh, the term of the contract is important. Most contracts are now year-to-year -year renewals, and how they renew, whether automatically or you actually have to do it, is an issue. And again, it, it sounds very pedantic and getting into minutiae, but there's actually stark law um, potential violation implications depending upon if you automatically renew your contract versus it lapses and has to be renegotiated every year. And then in terms of compensation, the model, and, and I think this is the same for Canada as, as here, is basic clinically, clinical productivity based remuneration. Uh, and here we use obviously the RVU and um, uh, most situations, if you can, <coughs> You want to negotiate an RVU-based compensation versus pure collections because you don't have control over collections. You have control over RVU, much more control anyway over the RVUs you generate. And the other thing that we might talk about afterwards is what's this conversion factor? Some institutions are a little more enlightened and will use a conversion factor in around their RVUs to make sure that you're appropriately compensated if you happen to be working in an area where um, your um, uh, your uh, schedule, your fee schedule is less competitive than, a, than, a, than a, another county or another uh, close by state. Um, uh, some institutions will actually uh, provide a conversion factor for your RVUs that puts you in, in a more stable position. You ask about that. Liquidated damages, and I'll just kind of run through. How are we doing on time? Good, okay. Liquidated damages. So this is the without cause clause. And this, again, you need to pay very close attention to. Um, this is, in fact, a two-way protection. This protects you and it protects the institution. 
And what, what, what I mean by this is the, the, the institution that you go to cannot gratuitously and summarily dismiss you without cause, without suffering a very hefty penalty. And conversely, you cannot gratuitously and summarily walk away from your job without suffering a very hefty uh, financial penalty. And so uh, these can be in the form of you must give 180 days, six months, you, or 90 days, or four months, or whatever. <clears throat> and the institution is bound by that same clause. And if either of you violates that term, you owe the other, usually in the order of $1,000 a day. So, <clears throat> so uh, again, that's a fairly hefty disincentive. Now, sometimes, if the institution wants you out for whatever reason, they'll pay that. And, and they will pay you $100,000 to leave or uh, $50,000 to leave. Now, you've got to play this right because if you mess around, they can do it with cause. So it's a, don't, 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 don't try to play that one too close because uh, that can be a with cause as opposed to without cause. Uh, without cause, they've got to pay you. Um, so this should be a part, and, and this is usually negotiable. That period um, of uh, of the uh, uh, that, that period of time, whether it's a 90 day or all the way up to 180 days, is is something that's negotiable usually. So here's what happens with cause. Uh, I don't know if you can read, but it says exit 329 closed. Sucks to be you, but I got fired today, so I don't expect any help from me. That would be <laughs> with cause. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> now, finally going through in the incentive, um, uh, incentive arrangements, um, try to keep these as objective as possible. Uh, again, the man, the organization that you're uh, um, uh, joining, uh, increasingly is going to want to speak to things like citizenship. And it's as hard for us to quantify as it is to you, but these are things like playing well in the sandbox, playing well with others, showing up for rounds, uh, doing your... Uh, doing your um, uh, charts and all that kind of stuff, uh, staying on top of things. Um, now, uh, we've talked about uh, your incentive arrangements, and again, I will, I will encourage you to look at RVU-based versus peer collections. For, for almost all of us, uh, that, that's going to be to your advantage to go for an RVU-based incentive because you, at the end of the day, do not control the collections that come in. Um, quality measures are increasingly going to be used. What are they going to look like? I don't know. But I'm going to tell you, as pay for performance is being rolled out increasingly in this country, quality measures are going to be used uh, to incent uh, your behavior and to, to affect your compensation. So whatever the quality measures are that are being focused on at your hospital that particular season, whether it's length of stay or surgical site infections or all these things, these are going to come into play increasingly uh, if the hospital's paid this way uh, they're going to incent your behavior along these lines. Um, whenever you're looking at these incentives, they've got to be achievable um, and, uh, again, in plain language as much as possible. You also need to understand how this is monitored and how you're paid. So um, are your incents, uh, when they say that this, your base salary is X and your incentives brings you to X, it brings you to Y, does that mean they really want to pay you Y or they don't want to pay you Y? And that's an important thing to understand from your employer. If your base salary <clears throat> is a is hundred thousand dollars, but your approved total approved is one hundred fifty thousand dollars, do they want to pay you, or are they going to try to get out of paying that that fifty? And and you can tell philosophically where they're coming from. So you know, I'm picking picking these numbers out of the sky, but at our place where I'm I'm at. I want to pay you whatever we, we talked about. And so, in fact, what we will do is I'll pay you the full amount. I'll pay you the whatever it is, 150. But quarterly or monthly, we'll see how you're tracking. And if you're not tracking very well, then we're going to claw back in future, in future months that portion of the salary that you're not, you have not um, achieved your incentive. Most of the incentives are, are all or none. Either you, you've hit that, that um, field, you've ticked that box, or you haven't, <clears throat> any partial ticking of it doesn't get you that incentive. Another way that your incentives can get paid is um, that you get monitored monthly or quarterly and then you get, the, you get the bonus. I think it's a much greater statement of faith in the relationship to pay you and then if you need to have it clawed back later, it's clawed back. This is gonna be an important part of all of your contracts uh, and again, the move to quality, paper performance, there's gonna be more and more focus on this uh, going forward. You need to be aware of it. 
Um, so uh, I'm just going to kind of finish up on a couple of things. We've talked mostly, the, the principles that, I've, that I've, I've talked to you about are the actual issues I've talked to you about cover academic versus private versus hospital-based practice. There are a few issues, germane really more uniquely to academic practice that you need to, you need to be talking about. Protected time. Uh, I, happen to, I happen to believe that increasingly this really is a myth. I've brought in an awful lot of funding dollars over the years, and I don't think I've ever known official protected time. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, um, and that you don't want to allow, especially junior faculty, um, uh, to, to, to be able to get themselves established, but I will tell you, uh, my thing that I always say to folks, if there's not a burning in your belly to get, to get this work done and to, to ask these questions and to chase these ideas, all the protected time in the world isn't gonna, isn't gonna make you productive. You can try to negotiate protected time, and depending upon the institution, you may or may be not be more successful. I will tell you, uh, uh, in Canada, you have a better chance of doing that. Here, it's an increasingly difficult negotiation. Um, you, can, you can certainly uh, uh, try, and again, some institutions are much more uh, uh, inclined along those lines. Always you want to be asking about space for um, research and educational activities, your lab or your educational, uh, what you want to undertake. Whether you're an academic or private, uh, OR access and block access is important. You need to understand in both uh, scenarios what the pathway to promotion is and what, the ex and what their expectations are and what your ambitions and expectations are. A very important part of the negotiation. The folks, folks know uh, what your career aspirations are. Uh, a, a very important uh, uh, part of the discussion now is what is the, insti uh, the um, uh, intellectual property um, policy in the institution you're joining. That is to say, if you've got ideas for products or devices or whatever, what do they claim? What is the institutional policy in terms of what they claim? Do they claim everything that's in your head at any point of time that you are employed by that organization? Or if you have stuff that you do in your garage on the weekends, um, is that theirs too? This is very important to clarify. What is the, what's the culture of your institution that um, motivates or incents or, disin or doesn't incent um, innovative uh, behaviors. And uh, you need at this stage in negotiating your contract to carve out. If you are working on stuff and you have stuff, you carve that out before you get in any negotiation. This I have done, I've worked on this before I come to your institution, you have no claim to this. It's a very important part uh, of the discussion at the outset. Okay, we haven't covered a few things. Call, malpractice, these uh, are absolutely uh, essential, uh, non-negotiable things you have to talk about. The how they play out tends to end up being fairly negotiable. Um, in your malpractice, if you're doing a private uh, entity, uh, what's the tail coverage? Were you to leave, what's the tail coverage? Um, we talked about OR blo uh, block time. Um, Professional fees, dues, licenses, this should be part of what's covered. Uh, CME, is there time? Are there resources for CME? And then how much time do you get off? And again, if you don't ask about these things, they are unlikely to be offered uh, um, other than in a boilerplate manner, and these are almost all negotiable. So, final uh, couple of thoughts. Negotiation, your focus on negotiation is driven by values, and these are unique and personal, and they include things like what are your compensation goals? Is, 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 is uh, compensation one of the prime drivers uh, for you in your new, uh, in your career? Um, location, how important is it to be near family? How important is it to be not near family? Uh, these, are, these are things that only you can answer. Um, the institutional reputation, how, how, how largely does that figure into your choice and uh, how, what are you willing to give up for a reputation? Uh, how important uh, is flexibility of your schedule, time off versus pure compensation? How important is the opportunity for advancement for you? And there's many other personal issues and for that reason um, I would say that that you really can't be, I can't be dogmatic in telling you what to hold fast on or what to compromise. It's way too personal. It's way too value driven. These are things that you need to be thinking about in your, in your preparation for your negotiations. I will tell you that everything is negotiable except that there will be a contract. It'll probably be about 25 pages. That's not negotiable. Uh, it's, it's also uh, a fact that the key elements that we've just gone through, compensation and sense, restrictive common, all those kind of things, will be addressed. That's not negotiable. Now, what those look like and how, uh, what the variables look like, that's negotiable, that, that you will have a contract that you must sign and that those elements will be addressed is, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is fact. 
Um, as I've said, I want you to remember that lawyers play a key role in this, but you can't let them take over the negotiations. In some ways, that undermines your credibility and doesn't set you in good stead uh, going forward. And really what you want out of this is a deliberate approach, building a base of trust and mutual consideration. That'll foster a long-term stable relationship, and that's really what you're looking for. And I thank you for your attention.